Welcome to our home. We're so excited to have you here with us today as we continue our discussion of the Book of Mormon. Today we are studying specifically Alma chapters 30 through 31. We're looking at three main topics. The first is leading away many women. Second, we're going to be looking at recognizing and avoiding deception. And then finally, we're looking at the topic of receiving to worship. We're excited about these discussions today and hope to have you join us. Welcome to Grounded where women of all ages, nationalities, and backgrounds gather together with me, Barbara Morgan Gardner, and my guest, as we strive to build a bedrock understanding of the life and teachings of Jesus Christ and become more like Him. We are so excited to have our wonderful friend, Emily Snyder, with us. Emily, thank you for being here. Thanks for letting me come. Thanks for joining us at this table. Hey, Emily, we remind our guests and our audience that we have three primary identities that President Nelson has talked about. The first is that we are children of God, children of the covenant, and then finally disciples of Christ. Mm -hmm. So in addition to those identities, how can you describe yourself to help us get to know you better? I get to be single. I've had so many incredible experiences being single over the last number of years. Um, for day jobs and where I make money, I currently work with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as a senior product manager. And I get to oversee a variety of different products and different projects. One of them is about women and thinking about like women's experiences at the church and kind of thinking through some of that. We're gonna come back to that. Okay, great. Okay. Um, I, in the past, have worked um, at Magnolia with Chip and Joanna Gaines in Waco, Texas. I got my MBA in New York City. I worked for Clay Christensen at Harvard Business School, which is where we finally got to know each other. Well, we did meet at Harvard after <laughs> years of people telling us that we should be best friends, right? It's like, finally, the Bar Morgan I've been waiting my whole life to hang yes. out with. Yes. And was a school teacher before that. I taught, what did you teach? I taught sixth grade in a low income school, which was heaven. And then a charter school was also amazing. But I would always, I always consider myself a teacher very first over anything else I've done. Okay. And as a teacher, you are a leader. Leaders and teachers mm -hmm. go hand in hand, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to bring this right into our first topic. Okay, great. So thank you for that introduction. Yeah. This leads into what you're doing now, but it also leads into what I know about you and your past as well. Mm -hmm as you have had experiences working with many women leaders of the church. Mm -hmm. When I think of Alma 30 and 31, I automatically go to Korahor, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then I go to this verse that, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. Sister President Julie Beck mentioned, who I know you worked with closely mm -hmm. and have a great relationship with. Mm -hmm. So I'm not gonna spoil it yet, but I'm gonna come back, back yeah. to this. Yeah. And then we're also going to talk about these, these wonderful people who are worshiping perhaps in a different way that yeah. we may consider faithful worship. Yeah, yeah. But I want to use your experience and your life background to teach us a little bit more about verse 18. I'm yes. just going to let you go there. Okay, super. Okay, so instantly right off the bat, and thus he, Korohor, did preach unto them, leading away the hearts of many, causing them to lift up their heads in their wickedness. So many fascinating concepts with that. Um, yea, leading away many women and also men to commit whoredoms, telling them that when a man was dead, that was the end thereof. So for those who may not know, we may probably just need to jump in and say mm -hmm. Korahor is an antichrist mm -hmm. who is trying mm -hmm. to destroy, I would say, the souls of the children of men. Yeah. Is that yeah. too strong? And the church and yeah, all the things. Okay. Yeah. Now we know that. Now yeah. we're talking about the wickedness that he's bringing in mm -hmm. here and this phrase then on. This false teaching. Yes. That, I mean, the, even the commas I think are interesting. Leading away many women, comma, and also men. And I just think that's fascinating because there's not very many times in the scriptures that the women are talked about first. Yes. And in this one, it is many of the women and, and I would paraphrase like some of the men. There were also men a part of this, but it was largely the women. I think in thinking about the power of, of female influence in so many aspects, this is very scary to me. Okay, tell us a little bit more about this. And I want every, everyone who's listening to understand that one of the things that you do, Emily, is you really are kind of understanding, you have a bigger picture that many do on women in the church mm -hmm. and experiences of women, is that right? Yeah, trying, trying to. Okay, yeah. trying to, yeah. learning yeah. through the process. And, I, and, and frankly, I think many of us are mm -hmm. trying to do that. Totally. But you kind of, you have this experience where you are learning a lot. Mm -hmm. Why is this disconcerting to you? Why is this troubling to you to know that this focuses on women here? I think so. Um, a friend of mine did a dissertation uh, a little bit ago about influence versus leadership in women's lives. Yeah. And that women don't love the word leadership, but they totally can understand the word influence and can lead into influence. I think we all can pause and take a step back and realize when a woman, when a woman influences something for good or bad, it soars. Um, I think King Solomon 
there was a scripture I remember in Old Testament about he was influenced by the foreign women. Yes. And that became the fall of his entire like ministry and kingdom was letting different influential women into his court. The power of a woman who knows who she is and knows what she is doing is cannot be touched and Satan can't fight that. And when he gets the hearts of women, it's game over. It is game over for that entire family, for that entire community. As we've kind of been playing with looking at different ward cultures, we all can tell if we were to look at our, our unit of worship, it is certain women that often become the culture creators of how that community mm. is run. Mm. What is acceptable, what is not acceptable. If there are kind of guidelines of like, oh, this is how we do something, it's probably largely because there's a female that's kind of creating the barriers or the boundaries about it. Or if it is very open mm. and expansive, it m largely might be because there's a number of women that are very embracing and accepting of different things. So that's very fascinating already. Yeah. So it's just an, I mean, and not a hard science, but as we're gathering different conversations and having some deep, deep dialogues, we all know this, that a woman's influence can't be touched. I'm going to share a quick quote, mm -hmm. quick or not mm -hmm. quote mm -hmm. by, by President Nelson. This is March of 2024 speaking mm -hmm. to all the women, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I, I just love this quote. Just I barely. Talk. Just, just barely. barely. Yep. So he says this, he invites the women, first of all, to make the scriptures your personal liahona, the temple your place of ref refuge and recalibration. Your personal prayer is the way you learn where God, where the Lord needs you to be that day. And then he says, over time, you will be astonished by how he will guide you to be exactly where you can lead, guide, and walk beside someone who needs you. And then he blessed the women with increased spiritual discernment, the ability to find joy in offering relief to others with wisdom to discern what is needful and not to run faster than they have strength. And then he blesses them with courage to live up to their divine privileges as a daughter, as a daughter of the covenant of God and to feel deeply that heavenly father, his son, Jesus Christ, know you and love you to realize that your divine gifts as a daughter of God, give you power, not to only change lives, but then he says, but to change the world. I mean, you're talking about this influence of women. Yes. And I think sometimes we can see this and just say, oh, yeah, I've been my ward. I'm just this little person and I really don't have a lot of influence. Women have influence. We know that, right? Yes. And they are. I mean, I love he in his plea to my sisters. This is so echoing so much of that of of women. We don't need permission to step up. It is already ours to step into yep. and to do it boldly and graciously. And I think that sometimes where it gets wonky is sometimes the graciousness isn't always there in our boldness. But the fact is we are so, I mean, I even hate saying it because it's like, are you kidding me? Of course, it's a we would never say this yeah. to any other audience. Of course, we're essential to this conversation. Yes, of course. Of I know. Course. We're even like, having this, this conversation. Like idiotic yeah. conversation to have. Right. Yes. But the reality of... Of women knowing this and leading and stepping into it. I've one reason why I love being single and I've had this single mm -hmm, I have tissues. Single journey is because I've realized that my success as a woman of God has everything to do with my relationship with God. Amen. That is it. Amen. That is Amen. the only yes. factor in that zone, the only metric of success. Marriage and family is an essential and the most beautiful aspect of the plan. And I believe in eternity. Yes. And I believe that there is a long game plan here. But my role as a daughter of God and me knowing who I am with Him is the only thing that I need to give myself permission to lead out boldly and proudly and graciously in the work that I'm doing and in my relationship and be able to say, yes, no, I don't need to have a certain calling to have an authoritative voice because I'm a daughter of God. So Emily, you bring me into this, and, and this is something I know that I've seen you do a lot. You are so good at this. It is, you are you help other people find their gifts and talents. Oh, that's so nice. Oh, it's true. So you, nice. I hope you know that's true, because there are many times that I just say, I wonder what Emily thinks. I mean, <laughs> not, that I, not that I need your personal, you know, but, I, but you have brought things to my mm. own eyes about myself, and I've heard mm. you positively express, this person has this kind of gift. This person mm. has this kind of ability. We have a prophet who is pleading with the sisters to understand and recognize and use their gifts, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think that what you're saying there is it's, it's, it's interesting. It's not that the prophet is saying, 
we need you in your scriptures. We need you at the temple. We need you. Right. He's not trying to give us a checklist. He's trying to help us see clearly who we are. Mm-hmm. The scriptures help us see clearly who we are. Yes. They help us build a relationship with God. The temple helps us build this relationship. It, it empowers us to reach our potential. It's mm-hmm. not just simply we're going to the temple. He wants the temple in us. He wants us Right. I mean, yes, that's he well, wants us to fulfill our, our the measure of our creation. And, and we're going to talk about this later. But the concept yeah. of because sometimes so another part of the conversations we've been having yeah. in my day job, we ask a lot of a lot of people. We do um, as a society, not just our side, but as as a human society, if you bear a child, you are expected to raise that child into a full-grown citizen that contributes to that society. Yeah. Like that's just the social creed yeah. of humanity. Take that into our church context, into our church community. We have a lot of other expectations to be a highly functional contributing member of our society. So to add all those layers, and of course we need our men, please don't hear anything. Like yeah, it course. is a team is effort. A unified, yeah. There is nothing that we can't, it is never going to be what we need it to be without a solid companionship and women take it on personally. Yeah. Take so much of that weight and responsibility personally. So I think another thing that president Nelson said in this quote that you just said, also the discernment and I would say the filtering of what and when. So for me, the temple and the scriptures actually help align the what and the when of the massive asks In my life right now, I know that temple and family history, I have nudges and I have such a desire. Mulan is my favorite movie for many reasons. (laughs) Thank you. Yes. Because of that ancestral pull. But temple and family history is not a to-do list on my world today. Yeah. Like that is not happening. But somebody in my home ward loves it and she has her whole family centered on it. That's amazing for her. I don't feel any guilt. Not one, that that's not on my to-do list. And so figuring out, I think, part of this owning our leadership and owning our influence, because to this core horror concept, that's where I think he got caught and that these women got caught was that there are so much and I'm so tired. Yeah, you can but, definitely see that. Here. And we do that. I mean, that's happening all over. We are so tired. But I think the power of the scriptures in the temple and that conduit of asking questions to, through the spirit helps the filtering and helps us be bold and strong. And like, this is what is what I've chosen with the Lord, and it's good. And, and a time and a place for everything with mm-hmm. women, but there's still that recognition and that understanding, as you're saying, that mm-hmm. I love this idea of the, the, the moral compass. Yes. You know, I mean, President Nelson has talked about that. We cannot lose the moral compass yes. of our women. There's a yes. sin-sick world. So he says this, we need women who have a bedrock understanding of the doctrine of Christ who will use the understanding to teach and help raise a sin-resistant generation. We need women who can detect deception in all of its forms. This is mm-hmm. section of mm-hmm. chapter 30 mm-hmm. of Alma, right? We need women who know how to access the power of God, that God makes available to covenant keepers, and who express their beliefs with confidence and charity. I love those two mm-hmm. words together. Mm-hmm. We need women who have the courage and the vision of Mother Eve. Mm-hmm. There is a time right now, mm-hmm. and I believe it's from now until mm-hmm. until the second coming of Jesus Christ, where women especially are being emphasized mm-hmm. in their important role of being these this moral compass of being able to discern, of being able to understand that the world is changing and there really is a lot of emphasis on women. And President Nelson says, we need you, right? So women and men, arm in arm, together, Mm -hmm. synergy at its Mm -hmm. finest. And Mm -hmm. if we lose this moral compass, as President Nelson says, we aren't going to get it back. Mm -hmm. And you see this right here, Mm -hmm. right? 100%. Well, and I think, can I just add in this bedrock of doctrine that asks curiosity, and I and focusing on that curiosity to ask the questions in the scriptures, ask questions in the temple of like, what would you have me learn? How would I know more about you through what I'm experiencing here at the temple or in the scriptures that then give the confidence to women to to stand boldly and to be have confidence and charity. I think one thing and we've also talked a lot about in this in my day job of with there this is a season for women. Yeah. After 4,000 years of the world's history, there is a time that the women are having a different voice. And shame on us if we just flip-flop it and decide that we want 4,000 years now of a women's voice. Yeah. If we don't recognize that that moral compass is also including to say we all rise together. Amen. Now that there's a, a season where a single female gets to have a voice of influence, which is the first time in the history of the earth 
what am I doing with it? And am I actually rising all boats and leading all people with me and not saying, okay, nope, it's my turn, but figuring out how to do that, which I would dare say there's a lot of that that's embedded in this verse of what Korahor convinced these many women and some of the men to think differently about. Yeah, I think one thing here is that he is he is switching, changing, resting doctrine. Mm -hmm. So he's he's conf he's trying to confuse mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I think that that's one of the reasons why we need a bedrock understanding. Mm -hmm. Never in in the history of mankind has there been so much information mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. much confusion mm -hmm. that is just being bombarded throughout the world. Mm -hmm. I, I I as a as a as a religion professor, as a mom, mm -hmm. as a teacher, as a friend. I hear so much confusion mm -hmm. and I hear so many people not being able to figure it out and mm -hmm. wanting to. Mm -hmm. We have a prophet who is literally pleading with mm -hmm. the women to say, we need you mm -hmm. to know the doctrine. Elder President Ballard in 2014, speaking at BYU to the women of the church again, he actually says, we need you to have a bedrock understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ and to spread it and to share it in any way you possibly can. Mm -hmm. And he says, in your homes, at a fireside, at the campfire, mm -hmm. you know, and, and he just lists all these different ways. And and this is incumbent upon us. Mm -hmm. I, I hope, I one of the reasons for this podcast, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll be this strong, is that I want women's voices, we want women's voices to be able to be speaking up mm -hmm. and speaking out, as mm -hmm. President Nelson has asked mm -hmm. us to do, to be able to understand the truth of the gospel so we can be gathered together with men who are strong, grounded individuals and just spread the truth mm -hmm. throughout the world mm -hmm. and just give opportunities for women who are grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ to just mm -hmm. teach and yeah. speak and testify. And to invite people to show how it's done. One thing I, we're, the church is, evolving from Absolutely. a from a land that was very much here's the answer now go execute now go live it yeah to what is your experience and yeah. what is your voice and what is your witness and if you can't testify are you actually having those experiences to witness god's hand in your life are you seeing them and that's what i feel like so much of this pushes is this is no longer a season of we're going to tell you the answers and I just reverberate, you know, regurgitate them. Absolutely. We are inviting and encouraging one another to have the own, our own personal wrestles of, of asking the questions, of having the come to Jesus moments of like, this doesn't make sense. I don't understand this. Cool. Go ask the questions to the God of the universe who will actually, through the Spirit, be able to teach you and you get to then stand boldly and have your own witness. Absolutely. Emily, I think this has been a fantastic discussion on on leading away many women, mm -hmm. but recognizing in so doing that we have the influence to bring in and empower and help many women, yeah. many men, many mm -hmm. children, that we work together to do this. Mm -hmm. So let's go into our next topic because it really fits so well in this. Mm -hmm. Let's go into this topic of recognizing and avoiding deception. Super. I think that that's a lot of what's happening mm -hmm. and clearly this is one of the roles of women today, mm -hmm. all, all people, mm -hmm. but since we're talking about leading away the many, many women. women. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about women and, and helping us recognize and avoid this deception that love is it. happening in our day. Love it, love it. You ready Super. to guide us yep. on this, friend? Yep, yep. I just want to kind of do a walk through a little bit of chapter 30. Um, the beginning of 30, if we recall, which I always have to remember, this was one of the most intense wars yes. the Book of Mormon has ever seen up to this point. So much so in verse 2, it says the dead were not numbered because of the greatness of their numbers. Like they didn't even have, like not only were the Lamanites not numbered, but they couldn't even do it with the Nephites because there were so many. Yeah. So that has just happened. And then they have a year plus of peace and then enters Korahor. And I just think, oh, are you kidding me? You guys, and then I instantly pause and think, where am I doing that? And, fig and thinking through, when have I had great battles, mentally, emotionally, that have just left me so exhausted, and I'm so grateful for the peace? And then how quickly do I let Korahor type figures into my life? Oh, like, it just good. is a very quick, like, I've learned to not be critical of the stories, but then to be like, huh, this story wasn't for them. This is for me who's reading it. So what am I learning? The interesting part in verse 6, instantly this man comes in and he is instantaneously defined as he was an antichrist, which then led me on this like, okay, what does that mean? What what actually is an antichrist? And so I kind of um, looked through all the handy things online, guide to the scriptures, 
an antichrist openly or secretly opposes Christ is a deceiver. John says in the um, reference in the Bible dictionary, he would, um, one who would assume the guise of Christ, but in reality would be opposed to Christ, which I was like, ooh, gosh. And then uh, dear Julie Beck gave an amazing talk um, in 2009. She's such an incredible woman oh, leader, et cetera. But okay, go ahead. Such a <laughs> team, Julie. Yeah. Um, teaching the doctrine of the family and her definition would be anything that is anti-family is anti-Christ. So then with those definitions, just going into thinking about, okay, what, because at this point in the, in the chapter, we don't know exactly what he's saying, other than it gives context of like, the law couldn't touch a belief, which is where we're at. Yeah. Like it's a, the law will never touch a belief, but it turns into a problem when it is actually causing problems in people's lives. He starts leading the hearts of many, causing them to lift up again their heads and their wickedness. That I think is interesting because we're asked to bow our heads in reverence. And we just talked about President Nelson wants us to be confident. We want bold and gracious and to lift up their head in a confident wickedness. Oh my gosh. And um, the verse above that, he's encouraging them that every man prospered according to his genius. It had nothing to do with Christ, that every man conquered according to his strength. And what whatsoever a man did was of no crime. Like that's the philosophy that he's trying to teach of like, you've got this, you are confident, which there is a lot of that in a Christ doctrine. Absolutely. But he's forgetting the Christ piece of it. He's forgetting the Christ piece. In fact, this is one of the reasons why I believe this is so important is I can see even this happening today. And I'm going to be I'm on the positive side, and but also kind of a warning mm -hmm. is that do we know our doctrine mm -hmm. well enough to know that if somebody like a Korahor comes in and starts teaching this stuff, we can just look and say, no, yeah. that's funny. Right. No. Or right. are we in a position where we're saying, I actually have no idea if that's true or not. Right. And that is also real. And I'm not saying that that is a bad thing. I'm saying recognize where we are mm -hmm. and all of us have room for improvement mm -hmm. and just say, perhaps I need to understand more about the atonement of Jesus Christ in this case, yes, because he is specifically talking about Christ and mm -hmm. he is an antichrist. He's mm -hmm. trying to take people away from him. Mm -hmm. And he does so in a very flattering mm -hmm. way, mm -hmm. in such a way that he's even making people feel stupid for their yes. beliefs, right? Which is the yes. irony here. Yes, He's playing on their weaknesses. Yes, right? yes. And saying, you're a fool yep. to think this way. In a different group of people in verse 23, he says, um, I do not teach the foolish traditions of your fathers because I do not teach this people to bind themselves down under the foolish ordinances and performances which are laid down by ancient priests to absurd power and authority of them to keep the people in ignorance that they may not lift up their heads but be brought down according to thy words. Ye say that this people is a free people but behold I say they are in bondage. Basically this mindset of like these traditions you are using to hold these people at your command. Yep. And I'll be totally honest. Sometimes I could see if you don't know doctrine and if you haven't found Christ through this structure of a church, I can see that that could come across at times. If you don't feel like you actually know the why behind all of yes. this, there are a lot of practices that we have. There are a lot of cultural norms that happen because of the ordinances and principles that we believe in, but that finding the intent of the, the leaders of our church has everything against this. It is the exact opposite, which I'm so intrigued with those definitions of deceiving an antichrist, because he's saying words that are flipped. You're reminding me of a great talk that is often often quoted by seminary institute teachers, religion professors. It's J. Reuben Clark's The Charted Course. Mm -hmm. And in that talk, he's he's looking to the future and saying, we need you as leaders, as religion teachers, as parents, etc., to be able to have the X and Y axis. He's talking about making sure that your compass is right on the mm -hmm. mark. Mm -hmm. And then he says, make sure that your students, that your children, etc., understand and have a deep, deeply rooted in the doctrine of the atonement of Jesus Christ, as well as in living prophets, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. your, your Y and your X axis mm -hmm. that you can just bring them in there mm -hmm. and help them have an understanding and a testimony, which is exactly what Korahor, the two things he's nailing right here. 
He's trying to decouple God with his mm -hmm. prophets, mm -hmm. and then he's also trying to teach there is no Christ, right. and your prophets are a mess, yep. right? Yep. And, and I love where, where Alma just comes in and he says, I, I love this, thou knowest that we do not glut ourselves upon the right. lives of our people. He, right. does, he doesn't even put up yeah. with it. He's like, whatever. <laughs> but the problem is, and to your point, I think this is very real. Not everyone's an Alma, and not everyone has had these experiences mm -hmm. living closely or having associations with these prophets where they can testify from personal experience, this is how I've seen it. Mm -hmm which then requires them to have a personal testimony. Even somebody who is married to the prophet, Sister Wendy Watson Nelson, for example, right now, she knows he is a prophet because of revelation, mm -hmm. because she's paid the price, mm -hmm. not just simply because she's married to him. Right. Right. Because, I mean, in some reality, I mean, I think for those that don't, we have our local leaders. Yes. And that is a tricky space because they are very human. We are all so human in this. And how do I hold true to this? with that charity and yet confidence that so we're all figuring this out together. We're all trying to practice this. And we we all have people in our lives that have probably shown up in their leadership in a way that has been hurtful. Uh, absolutely. And has been has probably felt limiting in many ways, depending on how they know how to show up in their leadership. And so I think it's this interesting spot of he is attacking so many insecurities and so many real question marks and is saying, don't worry about it versus stay in it and stay with the wrestle. Okay, so you, you mentioned Sister Sister Beck and mm -hmm. her talk about anti-crisis, mm -hmm. anti-family. So and, good. And, and understanding what deception is. And mm -hmm. I hope that we are tying that mm -hmm. in. If mm -hmm. it is anti-Christ, mm -hmm. it is also going to be anti-family. Mm -hmm. It's going to be anything that is anti-eternal mm -hmm. family, right? They go hand in hand. If yeah. it's anti-family, it's also anti-Christ right. because that's the point. Can I read some of the things that yes, I, mean, I might have highlighted a lot? But yeah. So settle in. In addition to understanding the theology of the family, we need to understand the threats to the family. If we don't, we can't prepare for the battle. Evidence is all around us that the family is becoming less important. Marriage rates are declining. The age of marriage is rising and divorce rates are rising. Uh, um, we see unequal relationships between men and women, and we see cultures that still practice abuse. Many of our youth are losing confidence in the institution of family. And I would dare say I'm in that camp. I mean, I feel like at this point in my life, I've seen so many broken families and marriages and relationships that I'm, I'm oftentimes in the camp of, Prove to me why. Prove to me the joy that supposedly everybody's found in f being married with children because I don't know that we're having that conversation loudly. Oh, yeah. I that's think true. there's so much hurt that we're not compensating the hurt with the powerful joy that is found in a marriage and in families. This is a season of articulating our why, our yeah. own personal why of why do we do church? Why do we do temple? Why do we do marriage? And why do we do family? And I just would invite everybody I know to figure out their own whys because I need to hear it. I need to hear why I want to keep looking and why I still want to stay open to a marriage concept or a family concept. Could you see Korohor just saying, I know you're going to go back. Oh, yeah. Could you just see Korohor saying, and by the way, there is really no eternal family. And right. By the way. And it's too hard. Yeah. And why do it? You can go further, faster. I mean, it's his comment of it's about your own strength. Well, like, well, what can... Go be all the things. You're going to do it better when you don't have all these people you're taking care of. Yeah. When you're not tagged along with all these people. But like, no, 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 you can't. Yeah. You can't go farther by yourself. You have to do it in a in a group. Okay. Okay. There's the tears. Um, she also talks about uh, Satan doesn't know. Satan knows he will never have a body. He will never have a family. And so he targets young women and young men who will create the bodies for future generations. And she then talks about Korohor. He is, Korohor was an antichrist. Antichrist is anti-family. Any doctrine or principle our youth hear from the world that is anti-family is also anti-Christ. It's that clear. If our youth cease to believe in the righteous traditions of their fathers, as the people described in Mosiah, if our youth don't understand their part of the plan, they too are being led away. And then, sorry for being so no, good. No, I love this. Please. She says, motherhood and fatherhood are eternal roles. Each carries the responsibility for either the male or the female half of the plan. Youth is the time to prepare for those eternal roles and responsibilities. And then she's talking to the parents basically and saying, live in your home so that you're brilliant in the basics. So much of what we're talking about. So that you're intentional about your roles and responsibilities in the family. Think in terms of precision, not perfection. 
If you have your goals and you are precise in how you go about about them in your homes, youth will learn from you. They will learn that you pray and why. They will learn to study the scriptures together and why. To have family home evening together, to make a priority of meals and speak respectfully to and with your marriage partner and why. And then from your example, the rising generation will gain great hope. Woo, that's so good. That's that's a pretty high call for you know, know for those of us who have a long ways to go. But, right. but it's a good point. But that's I mean yeah, I love that precision. in the like it's not a perfect family. Amen. Nobody think heavenly has one, but it's not about that. It's about we're choosing to be deliberate in what we're creating yes. and what we're doing and why we're doing it. Our, our topic was was on avoiding mm-hmm. and being able to understand mm-hmm. this. It was recognizing and avoiding deception. Mm-hmm. And I think what we're going to see here is one of these ways to avoid deception mm-hmm. and to recognize it, first of all, is in found in chapter 31. Mm-hmm. And it's mm-hmm. verse 5. Mm-hmm. And he says, And now as the preaching of the word had a great tendency to lead the people to do that which was just, yea, it had more powerful effect upon the minds of the people than the sword or anything else which had appeared unto them. Therefore, Alma thought it was expedient that they should try the virtue of the word of God. Should try it. Just, just try, try it. it. Just just take a gander at it. So, Emily, I, one of the things, and for everyone listening, one of the great ways that we can avoid deception is to know God's word. Mm-hmm. I, I, I talk about triangulation. I hear this often, but it is the triangulation I would give. And the two, two things, frankly, three things that he's fighting. One, know the scriptures, mm-hmm. know the word of God. Mm-hmm. Two, know the prophets, mm-hmm. know what they're teaching. And three, the confirmation of the spirit. Mm-hmm. Because people can twist the scriptures right. and people can twist the word of God, but the spirit can't be twisted. In earlier chapters, we're yeah. talking about the anti-Nevi-Lehites. Mm. I, I, I strongly recommend for all who are listening, on the church's website, you can actually go and they have two different parts where you can look at. One is just doctrines mm-hmm. of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one is doctrinal principles. Mm-hmm. And it really does, Elder Elder Bednar teaches us that a, a doctrine, and, and there are many others, mm-hmm. but a doctrine is a, is a never changing truth and it has eternal significance, mm-hmm. right? And so we can look at these doctrines. There are some doctrines that Coral Horse fighting right here. The doctrine of the Godhead, mm-hmm. the doctrine of the atonement of Jesus Christ, the doctrine of the plan of salvation. Mm-hmm. It's incumbent upon us that we know these so that mm-hmm. people can't come in and say, well, you really don't know what you're speaking about. Right. Well, actually, I do, and that's why this is not going to work for me. Emily, this has been a great discussion on on recognizing and avoiding deception. And again, as we as women, we, we really have been asked to hone in on this. Let's take it then for our next discussion, which is on receiving to worship. Mm-hmm. That's an interesting phrase. Can mm-hmm. you guide us through this? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's fascinating. As I studied these two chapters, the deception also bleeds into this Ramiumptum land. Yes. Which I think is fascinating that we see the Antichrist version, but we also see a deception in the Ramiumptum and the Zoramites as they are worshiping in a very different way. So the thing that I'm intrigued with this, as I studied how the Zoramites were worshiping, there was a phrase that I was really struck with um, in 23. And we know, hopefully we all know this Ramiumptum story that they all come in and they basically... Ammon, Aaron, and Omni kind of walk into this land and they see them up on this tower what saying that? the recited prayer over and over again and then they walk away and it's just kind of, wait, what? What just happened? I could, I would love to. Like, is that for real? Yeah, is, did that just really <laughs> happen? Yeah. So in 23, it says, now after the people had all, fascinating, offered up thanks after this manner, they returned to their homes, never speaking of their God again until they had assembled themselves together again on the holy stand to offer up thanks after that manner. And I just think it's fascinating. Again, I hold so many mirrors up of like, hmm, when do I do that? Do I show up? And again, we've talked about the regurgitating of different verbiage. This is exactly what they're doing. Do they just recite this constant and count it as their thanks, as their worship? So they think they're going about this worshiping experience to sing praises or give praise and thanks to God. And it's made me deeply question the concept of worship. We didn't finish the story of Korhor in the fact that he then had a very consequential <laughs> or a very serious Awakening. consequence. Yeah. Right. There's a line um, I in studying this worship concept, Bruce R. McConkie gave a talk years and years ago, and he said, if you were to worship a cow or a crocodile, you'll get exactly what that cow or crocodile can give you. And it had all this mm. laughter in the video. He said, when you worship a God of the universe, there are other things that happen. And we see that with Korhor. It's beautiful. So then it makes me curious in thinking about these men and women of the Zoramites and how they got to this point and their definition of worship versus what I believe worship would be 
they weren't, the very fact that they returned to their homes, never speaking of their God again, is the exact opposite of what Sister Beck just invited us to do, of live it, breathe it, know why you're doing it. That's not what they did. And yet they thought they were worshiping. And so I've been trying to tease out what is the difference for me, and there's a couple different talks that I've delved into, but worship is receiving. I think, I, I mean, as we've, if I've gone through the temple or any ordinance, it is always receive the Holy Ghost, receive her unto you, receive this. Receive the priesthood. Receive the priesthood. Whatever the concept is that the Lord is trying to give, he's, he declares, receive it. It's been a struggle for me as I've grown up in this culture of do. We're asked to do so many things. Good people take casseroles. I am the worst <laughs> at being that type of a giver. And I, I won't ever bring you a casserole. Thanks. And I, I won't ever give you one. I don't even know either. I'm like, <laughs> I'll help you in every other life, but yes. not that one. But the mindset of receiving... It's been a personal struggle for me to know how to to let to receive people. Like doing my life as a single individual away from family for so many years, I figured out how to do it. I figured out how to move furniture in by myself because I didn't have anybody to truly rely on and I didn't want to be a burden on whatever. Right. So the mindset of receiving has been a personal discovery of how do I actually let somebody in to help me? And then to take it to a God world, do I go through the scriptures and do I do my questions? Do I get curious and have really cool insights? But if I worshiped, two very different concepts and realizing I don't want to be a Ramayamtum member of the church. And I know that there are times that I do become a Ramayamtum member of the church. Even in my day job working for the church, sometimes I have to stop and think, have I brought Christ into this conversation? Or am I just going through the motions of this job? In fact, that could be an occupational risk from, from personal 100%, experience. Right? 100%. All of a sudden it becomes a job and not a work. Totally, worship. totally. Yeah. And uh, as I've analyzed and kind of played with this Rami Umptum land and the sorrow that Alma felt and, and all these people felt as they were walking into it, I'm just so curious of, I don't worship. I don't think we worship as a people and truly pay the reverence and respect to the God that has given us life and wants to give us everything he has, if I don't know how to receive his spirit, his gifts, and his communication. I, like, there is no worship in my mind without receiving. So Emily, I th you're, you're, you're saying this and it's causing me to think, well, so then how? Mm. Like, how, how do we then receive differently? I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's great to say do, but how, how do you make that mindset? And how do you distinguish between in this case, receiving the Holy Ghost and knowing the Holy Ghost. Mm. How do you distinguish between receiving and mm -hmm. allowing Jesus Christ into your life and his atonement? Mm -hmm. How do you receive a spouse, yeah. for example? In, in section 25 of the Doctrine and Covenants, we're kind of going back, but I love this because I love receiving in terms of a woman. Mm -hmm. Hearken unto the voice of the Lord, this is verse 1, while I speak unto you, Emma Smith, mm -hmm. my daughter. For verily I say unto you, all those who receive my gospel are sons and daughters in my kingdom. Mm -hmm. I just love, mm -hmm. he is he is pleading with her mm -hmm. to receive. Mm -hmm. And so that he, and so, so he can do something about it. So yeah. I've thought it, about it in terms of gifts, like as I'd love to go very basic. Yeah. I, there was a season when I was getting gifts from students and they gave me the best that they could. Yeah. And it wasn't, it didn't fit in my life, but I was so grateful I could accept it but it's not received until it is a part of my everyday life. Yeah, that's good. That when I, we can all, we've all got gifts from somebody that it's like, thanks so much. I can be so gracious and accept it well, but it doesn't change my life. It doesn't change my life in any possible way. So for me, the receiving is, did I truly see it, acknowledge it and bring it into my life? And do I bring it into my heart, into my mind? And did I pause enough to actually do that. I can read the scriptures and go through the motions. I can do all the things and be with a friend. I even had a therapist once say, did you receive that hug or did you give that hug? Mm, that's good. So, and it just, it takes a mental flip for me to pause and be like, oh, I'm going to receive this one. So Emily, how do you receive a relationship with mm -hmm. God? 
For me, it's the middle moments. It's the, do I, do I pause enough? And that's been the fascinating thing for me in analyzing. It's not a doing, it's a pausing. It's a, I don't have to do anything, but hold my hands out and just capture. And then, then the receiving and the changing happens as I just pause and appreciate. You're, you're speaking of that, of that receiving. And I think one of the things that we see, we have two prayers here in Alma 31. Mm -hmm. We have the prayer of the Ramayemptum, and then we have the prayer of this righteous prophet mm -hmm. who has, in your term, I believe strongly, received. Mm -hmm. He has been converted. Mm -hmm. He knows what it's like to have to plead mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. God for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. It has gone into the very souls of his heart. Mm -hmm. This is this is one who who has who has been changed mm -hmm. and converted to the gospel. You know, he's he's so concerned about how they're puffed up, and he's concerned mm -hmm. about their hearts being set upon the things mm -hmm. of the world. But I just love this prayer. I, I love this entire prayer. Mm -hmm. It's really verse twenty six mm -hmm. to about thirty five, but thirty four. He says, "O oh Lord." Wilt thou grant unto us that we may have success in bringing them unto thee in Christ? Mm -hmm. So that he, he he wants them to be received mm -hmm. by Christ. Mm -hmm. Verse 35, Behold, O Lord, their souls are precious, and many of them are, are our brethren. Therefore give unto us, O Lord, power and wisdom that we may bring these our brethren again unto thee. Mm -hmm. This idea of bringing and receiving, and mm -hmm. th this role mm -hmm. of this converted prophet, this mm -hmm. role of this converted mother, mm -hmm. of this converted friend, this converted teacher, mm -hmm. this converted day job person, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. that you discussed, mm -hmm. one, one who has received the Lord and really has received and worshiped the Lord mm -hmm. wants nothing more, nothing gives greater joy, nothing gives greater happiness than to have another soul be received mm -hmm. and receive Christ, mm -hmm. right? 100%. And they will give their lives to bring these souls into Christ. Mm -hmm. So I, the, the the frustration and almost the pain for me as I as I look at Korahor mm -hmm. and he's trying to bring people away from the two mm -hmm. things, two things that are so important and you bring in a third that's critical mm -hmm. as well. He's trying to deny them the relationship with God. Mm -hmm. He's trying to deny them the relationship with the prophets leaders mm -hmm. of this church mm -hmm. and he's trying to deny them their families. Yes. And that, is an antichrist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so critical as women, especially in this church as covenant women, we recognize that the church is true, but Satan is trying to destroy us. Mm -hmm. And we as women have a sincere responsibility mm -hmm. to receive. Mm -hmm. A responsibility, I don't mean that in a in a over like an no, overwhelming way, no. but to receive, mm -hmm. to quiet, and then to help other people bring them unto mm -hmm. Christ as well. Amen. Amen. Amen, sister. Love Emily, that. I'm going to finish off with okay. one question for okay. you. We've okay. So much we could talk about. So first of all, just thank you for mm, all that you. you've shared and these thank ideas you. and especially this topic of receiving. Mm. I, it's just beautiful. Everything mm. you've shared has been mm. beautiful. But Emily, we'd like to finish off with asking the question, how has the Book of Mormon changed your life? Mm. Which is such a fun question. I had a friend, I was talking about it with a friend and the comment was, for it to change a life means your life would have to evolve, you know, and, and move from what it once was. And so I don't know if it's a departure of a once life, of a life that I once led, but the Book of Mormon gives me such great visuals of what life looks like with Christ and without Christ. Mm -hmm. And I can open any page and see very quickly the consequences of choosing to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior and the consequences of choosing not to. And I love that I get to choose Jesus Christ and know him deeper through the people that have chosen him and those that haven't. Emily, I, I, you, we started talking about the important and the impact and the influence of righteous women. And you are one of those righteous mm -hmm. women. Thank you for impacting me. Thank you for impacting so many. Thank you for spending so much of your life mm. helping other people receive Jesus Christ. Thanks. Thank you for being a true disciple. Thank you for being grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ as well. Thanks. You too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we would like to thank all of you for joining with us today. We thank Emily, especially for being here for the great high five. We invite <laughs> all of you, uh, women and men, to continue to receive Jesus Christ into your life, to recognize how to avoid this deception, and also that we recognize, as women specifically, that we are in a position where we can lead and influence many to Christ. We invite you to share this podcast with others with the intention of bringing other people to Christ and also subscribe. We appreciate you being here today and we will see you again next week on Grounded. <laughs>